Hi, everyone. Um, so today I'm going to talk about the freeloader's guide through the Google Galaxy, and I hope the presentation is as fun as the title for everyone. Um, so I think this story starts a few years back, um, you know, maybe five years ago, where we had uh, this ubiquity of smartphones and the emergence of IoT in our spaces. And we were really trying to come up with ways with which people could interact with these devices that were starting to emerge that weren't really quite so useful yet. And we saw these commercial technologies come out from people like Google and Apple, uh, specifically um, Eddystone and iBeacon, that really pitched a vision of interactive connectivity. And specifically, they pitched um, interaction patterns such as beacons in your physical spaces, informing applications um, at, that were on your smartphone you were using, and beacons pointing to web, web resources that your smartphone could pull down from the internet. And I think for this community, this is nothing new, but this is really the first time we saw it come to such a large scale on people's personal devices. And I think these patterns of interaction are really exciting, but for me, as someone who builds a lot of low power and connected sensors, I saw this as exciting for another reason. It really raised the question of, could these same patterns uh, enable this kind of uh, backhaul for sensor networks. So if we have sensors deployed in our physical spaces, can these same technologies enable us to transport data back to the cloud from these sensors? And I think this is such a big problem because the burden of connectivity is still really, really great for deploying sensor networks. Gateways, if we were to deploy um, gateways for the sensors themselves, are difficult to plan and deploy physically. They're high maintenance and low reliability. You have to visit them a lot and figure out how to fix them. And we have a lot of protocol fragmentation in the IoT space, and there's no just one gateway I can go buy and deploy that works for everything. And it turns out that smartphones fix a lot of these problems. If we had a universal smartphone gateway, we have mobility, and mobile phones go everywhere people go, which is often where our interesting applications exist. Users charge and maintain their phones so we don't have to go and fix the gateway infrastructure all the time. And they already contain some low power networking hardware. And my guess is that if a protocol emerged where we could transport data back through a smartphone, everyone would just jump on that bandwagon and move on and we would kind of solve our protocol problem by force. And this isn't a new idea. We've seen this idea come through the community before. We had a paper on it a few years back and I, I think people have been thinking about this for a long time, but unfortunately, it's never really materialized. And I think the primary reason for that is a misalignment of incentives. You know, why would a user spend their battery, spend their data on um, sensor data that they don't really care about? And then we also have concerns about security and privacy, and even though if a protocol did exist to do that, no one could really kind of come together on what that protocol would look like. So uh, despite all of these problems, um, a few months back, we figured out how to leverage Google's physical web um, through kind of an off-label use case such that BLE-enabled sensors could use anyone's Android smartphone as a smartphone gateway. And um, there's some caveats here. It's really, really slow. It's unidirectional. And your Bluetooth must be enabled. But literally, any Android smartphone could backhaul data from sensors we deployed in the physical environment. So to see how this works, let's step through a normal use case of Google's physical web, and specifically nearby notifications, which is the service that's running on everyone's smartphones um, to do this kind of work. So in the physical web, a beacon um, kind of has, sends an Eddystone BLE advertisement packet to point to a URL. Your phone when receiving this beacon, we'll then say, Google server, fetch some metadata for this URL. The Google server will go to its cache and say, do you have the metadata that I want for this URL? And if you have a cache hit, it will return the metadata, and there will be a list with um, uh, you know, the fav icon and the URL path that the user can click and navigate to on their phone. If there is a cache miss, the server will call a get on the path beacon by the URL, we'll have a response, and then the metadata will be returned and displayed for the user. And when we were looking at this interaction um, pattern, 
we notice that fundamentally what's happening is your beacon is sending some information that's eliciting a response that you can record on your server. And I think from here, it's not so hard to see that we could start transmitting data in these URL tags. And there are some design decisions that are necessary to make this actually transmit data. We have to introduce some randomness to the path to make sure that we don't keep getting stuck in Google's URL or cache. And um, kind of another design decision that ended up playing to our favor but was a little bit by accident is that if you omit HTTPS, which is technically required for the physical web, everything works except it doesn't get displayed to the user anymore. So you're doing this illicitly and no one really knows you're doing it. Um, and uh, I think at this point there are a few questions that everyone asks. And the first is, how much data can you actually transport? Well, the answer is not so much. There are only 17 bytes that fit in one of these URL beacon packets. And it's really hard to buy a domain name shorter than three letters long. So j2y.us was the shortest URL we could buy reasonably. So that leaves us about 10 bytes of data and randomness that we can transmit per packet. The second question that gets asked is, how often do phones listen for these packets? If they're never listening, we're never gonna get any data through. And we found out that they at least listen for a few seconds every time you pull your phone out of your pocket and turn on the screen. And I think in an aggregate situation, that ends up being a lot of listening time. They might also listen periodically in the background. It's a little hard to tell, and that could even be phone specific. And then the last question is, how can we actually avoid this caching mechanism that Google does? If they implemented infinite caching, of course, we could never send data repeatedly. So we ran a test where we put some beacons into the envir environment that send the same URL, some that send a different URL, and we see that for beacons sending the same URL, you get about 15 to 20 minutes before your server gets another request. So 15 to 20 minutes before you get a cache eviction. And um, in practice, this is about you know, one to two bytes of data at reasonable beaconing rates. So after we established the basics, we decided to do a deployment and see how well this worked in practice. We took 10 beacons and kind of put them randomly around Berkeley's campus in some classrooms, outside in a bush, in an atrium, and started having them send beacon at one hertz. And the results were honestly a little bit surprising. Across the week, we got 326 kilobytes of data from these sensors. Um, and we, you can see in the graph at the bottom, um, you see this diurnal pattern of bitrate where um, some highly occupied areas like the classroom, which is what's introducing those high peaks, get you know up to 2.6 bits per second when they're occupied, and some lower occupancy areas like the pathway outside, which is the blue line at the bottom, don't get so much, but they still get some bad data through. And while these bit rates are really, really low, they are enough to enable some interesting applications. You could imagine doing environmental monitoring on these bit rates, or just simply updating the status of your sensor, or possibly letting someone know the usage of a room or a hiking trail or something along those lines where you wouldn't really be able to normally deploy a connectivity or gateway solution. And um, I think this story takes a turn now because we submitted this paper back in October on the 19th, of course, that was the submission deadline. And not even a week later, we saw on the Android developers blog that we're discontinuing nearby notifications. And I'm not at all claiming this is causal because it wasn't, um, although it would be interesting if it was. Uh, and this really made us take a step back. You know, in the original paper, we were like, this is a cute trick, but what can we learn from it about deploying a real universal smartphone gateway? And then we saw this happen, we were like, okay, we should you know, think about it again. What can we learn from this now that it's no longer, now that this mechanism doesn't work anymore? And we really split the reactions into two different camps. The first camp is, oh my gosh, this is a security vulnerability, we need to shut it down right now. This is a side channel that we can't have open. And I think this is a reasonable response. I mean, 0 0.1 to 2.6 bits per second is enough to get a key or a password through a side channel from a key logger. And um, more glaring is that if your phone is interacting with a device, we probably should be letting the user know in some way that that interaction is occurring. I think the slightly more interesting path is this is totally a missed opportunity and we should figure out how to make it real and make it secure. It's also the much harder path. 
But there are opportunities um, to take the learnings from this. You know, it was easy to implement because we went through a narrow waste of DLE and HTTP. Um, we could think about how to extend it, uh, add custody transfer and delay tolerance, add end-to-end -end acknowledgments so we don't have this unidirectional data problem. Uh, we could think about how to better align user incentives using micropayments, um, potentially by implementing some kind of third-party data clearinghouse. And we could ensure that users have agency over when, where, and how they're actually transmitting data for other people. And um, I say this is harder because I think these expose their own research challenges. If we were to do uh, this kind of micro payment system, we'd have to be able to authenticate the data coming from devices and make sure that users trust the data going through their phones, which is especially hard if we have a lot of capacity constraints and energy constraints. And we would have to make sure that users are aware, which I think really goes into the work on verifiable visual indicators of peripheral access on phones that I'm really excited to see coming out recently. Um, so that's everything I have, but I'd love to take questions. Thank you.